spiritual connection to it because of his subject matter. Uh, we're going to pray for protection for him today. We're also going to pray for John Howler, who's not with us, but also speaking, I believe, on the left coast this morning. And uh, then we've got threefold communion, which I am extremely uh, looking forward to in anticipation, the unity of the body of Christ and, and just to bring glory to Jesus for what he's done for us. What a great day we have planned. So please uh, plan to... Uh, Stay with us for as much of today's services as you can do that. Um, as is our custom, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask you, especially this morning, uh, to join with me in prayer. We have a number of our people going through some very hard times right now. And we're going to pray a little bit generically for some of that. But we also have a specific prayer need that I wonder if we could, as the body of Christ, Lift up together, and uh, again, just let's lay everything at his feet right now. So if you'd like to pray with me, please, let's go to the throne of grace together. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, you are awesome. You are beautiful beyond description, and we worship you this morning in the beauty of your holiness. We're actually in awe, Lord, when we sit and think about your great power. When we sit and think about your attributes and just that you're so full of truth, Lord, you, there's no darkness in you. God, how wonderful it is that you cannot be deceived into sinning. Uh, there's no capacity in your nature to be tempted, and you don't tempt us. And Father, we thank you from the testing, though, that you allow that comes from your hands. Lord, we thank you for the times of trial, even, because of what they're producing in our spiritual lives. And Father, some of us are going through some really hard times right now, some hardships that in some of our minds and experiences defy even the words to articulate them to another human being. And Father, I want to pray right now for all of those specifics that you know, because we don't know what our brother and sister sitting right next to us this morning is going through in some cases. We have no idea what some of us had to deal with on the way to church this morning or with our families this week. Father, we have no idea of the things that are in our physical bodies that need treatment that we don't even know about, but that in time we're going to have to trust you about. Father, there's family issues and there's relationship issues. And there's emotional, physical, and spiritual hardships this morning that you know absolutely every single detail about. And we praise you for that because only an all-knowing God who's also all-loving and all-powerful is worthy of our worship this morning and you truly are worthy of that worship, God. There's nothing in our lives that compares to the value of knowing you. And Father, I pray this morning. Lord, I know of a couple, a young married couple who has a problem right now with a little child in the womb of that mother. And God, you know all the specifics. And you know what the doctors say. And you know the anguish that a mother has when given a diagnosis about the possible death of the child that she's carrying. And Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, we ask this morning, Lord, it would be so wonderful for you to heal this little child. For you who are knitting that child together in the womb as we speak. Lord, for, for what ends and what purposes, we know not, but you know. And God, if it involves him surviving or that little child, if it's a girl or a boy, we don't know, but Lord, you know. You know all the plans and all the, the scope of days for this little one. And Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch this little child and that you would bring peace to the mother and a stable, steadfast trust and faith, Lord. Help, help this couple as they are weathering a situation right now that you, again, know all the details of and we don't. But Father, that's a prayer request that we want to make this morning from the depths of our heart as we cry out to you, God. Heal this little one and strengthen the parents. 
Father, I lift up John, who's speaking this morning and has spoken several times in the last week, Lord, and he has said some things that definitely are poking the devil in the eye in the sense of saying things to the body of Christ that he does not want us to know. And God, I pray for the safety of John Haller this morning and Pam, who's by his side. Lord, I pray that you give him the words this morning. God, I pray for my brother, Pastor Mike Clapham here this morning. God, I thank you for his ministry here. We're all blessed to receive the teachings that you give him. Lord, for the insights and the, the love of the scriptures that he models and has for us at every turn. Father, he's going to speak today in accordance with your will, and we just ask that you give him strength right now to do so. Lord, that you help him uh, to, again, put all his faith and trust in you to get him through the next teaching hour. Lord, the subject matter, once again, something that we believe needs divine enablement to be able to uh, say correctly and to say right, especially in the face of what we're witnessing today. Father, I pray for the subject matter of this sermon that we're about to look at together, Lord. God, it's going to be rough around the edges. You know this. <laughs> and yet, Father, it's just jam-packed full of such great truth that it makes me want to jump up and down today. Lord, I ask that every single part of our service, and our observance, and even as we go home and think about your goodness today and through this week, Lord, that we would just enjoy your presence. And Father, finally, this prayer this morning... I'm going to pray for the unbelievers that we know. I'm going to pray for those who do not have the hope that we have. God, who do not know what's going to happen tomorrow, and that frightens them to death, or else they're burying it under just pretending not to care. But Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would convict the hearts of the sinners. God, we're sinners. We, we, we just, but we, we're, we're recipients of your mercy and and our sins are removed and taken away as we confess them to Christ, our advocate. And we have that relationship. We're in your house, Father. We are your children, Father. But so many that surround us do not know you. They are not in the household of faith. They do not have the blood of Jesus applied to their lives. They have not yielded to Jesus Christ and what he did in their place at Calvary for their salvation. So, Father, I pray for them this morning that even by day's end, in many cases, people would turn to you and take up their cross and follow Jesus. Father, thank you for the body of Christ here at FBC. Thank you for their willingness to pray for us. And we pray for our friends who are going to be listening today, Lord, in the islands of Hawaii. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Detroit. We have friends in Canada. Father, we got people all over the world that are tuning in at some point to hear your word and they also keep us in prayer and we thank you for them in our lives. May you be praised today. May you receive the glory because you alone are worthy of that glory. It's about you. It's about Jesus, the head of the church. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Do you know how refreshing it is to... Be a part of a church body that's willing to let me pray like that and to know that we're praying together on these things. And I just, I'm thrilled, man. We are living in a, in a turbulent, crazy time, but we have a powerful God. And we have the scriptures. And so if you turn with me today to Mark chapter 1 this morning, Mark chapter 1, I'm telling you now we are not going to finish any of what I have on this paper today. But we are going to have some scriptures. I will be mentioning some references, and most of which you're going to have to go to at another point. And we're going to be skipping around the Gospels a little bit, albeit on the same issue as we pick it up last time. Last, last week's sermon was called Healings in Capernaum. And we read this. Look at verse 29 of Mark chapter 1. It says, immediately after, this is after his fame has 
spreading throughout Galilee because he's cast out a demon in the synagogue there at Capernaum. His city, Peter's house is there, probably where Jesus is staying. It says, verse 29, And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand. The other gospel tells us that he rebuked the fever, and the fever left her. And so restored was she in an instantaneous fashion. She served them. She got up and started cooking. Started bringing stuff over to eat. Isn't that great, man? Wouldn't you like that kind of outpatient uh, situation there in your life? But again, where Jesus is, there's healing. And there's restoration and there's wholeness in accordance with the will of God. And Christ heals her with a word. And I love it. He has mastery over the fever. We talked about it last time. This high fever could have been microbial. It could have been viral. There could have been something else going on that we don't even understand. It doesn't matter. Jesus has mastery over these things. So he's able to heal the mother-in-law and raise her up. I love it. So now let's pick it up this morning in verse 32. And again, we will skip to a couple Gospels, but I think you'll see my point here this morning. I want to exalt Jesus Christ this morning. I want to praise God for His Son and His power over the demonic spirits. I want to praise Him for His power over every issue that we face in our lives. I want to thank Him for His victories. I want to thank Him for the great and mighty awesome signs and wonders that He did among these people. Try to picture what would it be like in those days if suddenly afflictions were just being immediately removed from somebody's life. Life-altering physical devastations to the body, diseases, they're all gone when Jesus says, get out. When Jesus puts his hand on a leper, when Jesus uh, finds the, the paralytics. And again, we see this constant refrain here in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We don't want to miss this this morning. The demons are quaking in fear in the presence of Yeshua. I love it. Look at verse 32, when evening came, and we ask ourselves why, because it's the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, people start coming out after sundown because that's when Sabbath ends. When evening came, it says, after the sun had set, they, that means the, the people in the areas around there and in Capernaum, it says, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were, again, in the Greek would be demonized Demon-possessed, controlled by an indwelling evil spirit, an unclean spirit. They brought him to Jesus. Verse 33 says, the whole city had gathered at the door. And again, we assume this is the door of Peter's house. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases. And he cast out many demons. And he was not permitting those demons to speak because they knew who he was. Two weeks ago, we talked about a theory. How did these demon spirits know who he was initially? And I want to say, first of all, once again, just by way of review, some of you had asked me about it. I'm going to just restate it for a moment. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He's the second person of the Trinity. Uh, excuse me, the third person of the... Yeah, second person of the Trinity. Got it. Whoa. Woo. Yes. Good morning. <laughs> Second person of the Trinity, yes. Man, I've, I've, numbers, it's, it's a numbers thing. Just right That's all you need to know to know that the demonic realm was absolutely aware of who he was. Amen? He's the Son of God. So if that's all we knew or that's, that's all that's going on here, great. That's awesome too. But wouldn't it be cool if indeed, as many of the Jews believed, the demons were the disembodied spirits of the giants that were killed in the Old Testament. And these giants were killed in mass by two figures that we read about. Not including the armies of Israel, but the captain of the Lord of hosts, the, the, the armies of heaven, the angel of the Lord 51 times in the Old Testament, who we believe is what? A pre-incarnate appearance of Yeshua. He killed a bunch of them. 
So there's the recognition. And there's also a really neat play that we don't have time to go in here, but who also was commanded by God to destroy the Nephilim from the lands surrounding and in the promised land there, uh, a guy named Yehoshua or Joshua or, as we find later, Yeshua. I just think it's very fascinating. There's something going on here, people, that's a, that there's a reason behind the instant recognition of the demonic spirits. Once again, it may be nothing more than the fact that Jesus is God and they all know it. Amen? That's all we need to know this morning. But I just think there's something really cool going on here. He could have been recognized for being the one that dispatched the first body they were in. <laughs> that's what I like about it. This is wild, right? Let's keep going. But he wasn't permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. It's an instant authority over these spirits that were so hard to cast out, apparently, in Jesus' day. Matthew 8.16 tells us, same, same account, that he cast out demons with a word. Again, utter authority. He just has to speak and they go. Shut up, Jesus says to the demonic spirits, and get out. Hit the bricks, baby. Don't let the door of the synagogue hit you on the way out. That's what he's saying, man. Effectively banished from that immediate locale. Go with me to Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 4. You're going, well, are you just, you know, camping on this whole demon thing? Because, Well, you know, yes, because I have to go to Africa and talk about it. And this is a real thing, man, in these other countries and in this one. And I think there's something else that we're being challenged about in this time where we're looking at this effective aspect of Jesus' ministry. Could it be that we need to be praying for opportunities to help people get delivered from demonic spirits here in America and in our lives? We're going to have opportunity to see the supremacy of Christ over these fallen spirits. Look at verse 40 to 41 of Luke chapter 4. While the sun was setting, here we go again, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And laying his hands on each one of them, we're told in Luke's gospel, he was healing them. Jesus is not afraid to touch you if you're sick. He has nothing to worry about. It's in his hands where there's the healing. And so I love this picture of multitudes outside the door here in Capernaum you know, crammed into these little narrow streets and, and just stretching out to the outskirts of the town. And, and they're just coming up and lining up and Jesus just really doing that. Really touching them and watching them instantly healed. Verse 41, demons also were coming out of many, shouting. What are they doing as they're exiting this person? You are the son of God. But rebuking them, Jesus said, he would not allow them to speak because they knew him to be Mashiach. They knew him to be the Christ. Wouldn't there just, isn't there just a little bit in you that would like to witness that? And to hear these spirits just screaming out in anguish because they just can't hold on to these poor people that have been afflicted, some of them for many years. My goodness. Amazing power. We don't need to turn to Matthew 8 again, but verse 17 tells us that this all that is happening here, this Galilean ministry of Jesus, these signs and wonders, these messianic miracles, these amazing deliverances from the powers of darkness that are happening publicly, and in the witness of many spectators, and the crowds are growing, all of this is in fulfillment to many of the prophecies of the Messiah in Isaiah, including the one Jesus read in Nazareth and including Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. You don't need to go there, but trust me, it's already been prophesied that Jesus would come and do these things. I will call attention at every turn when the scriptures call attention to it, uh, showing us where Jesus does something and then it says, in effect, this is that that was prophesied about Jesus. I want you to see everything he's doing, every step he's taking. Every act that he is performing, every, every part of his person and his ministry and his work among the people, it's all God-ordained work. It's all He's been sent by the Father to faithfully fulfill everything that has been prophesied about him. And once again, he fulfills uh, something like 300 prophecies here already 
uh, in the scriptures when we look at the life and the, and the birth of Jesus and all the things surrounding it. And I want to promise you, this is my first point here for those watching beyond this room. Jesus is going to do everything in accordance with the word of God all the way through the end times program that still has yet to come. Amen? God has been faithful in fulfilling prophecy through Jesus Christ for all these years. And ever since the Old Testament, the prophets have been given the message and it's turning out to be 100% fulfilled and accurate in every point. What makes you think God's not going to finish the way He started with complete accuracy? And we can have trustworthiness in the prophecies of Scripture that have yet to be fulfilled. Amen? This should get us excited. This should make us realize that we are not just dealing with some religion that has a couple of rules attached to it or a holy book. This is far beyond that. This is 1,400 years of revelation, 40 different authors, prophets, priests, kings, all manners and walks of life, and yet the message absolutely adheres to itself in consistency. I want to add in utter and complete relevance for you today. Oh, we're reading about what Jesus did in the past, and we're celebrating the faithfulness of God as we read about Yeshua and his power over disease and demons. But he's the same today, yesterday, and forever. He will deliver you today if you trust in him. He might heal you if that's what he has in God's perfect will for you. But he will give you eternal life as you repent of your sins and believe on his name this morning. This Jesus will finish what has been started. This beautiful triune God is going to be faithful all the way to the end to where every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. It's all been proven. It's all been backed up by history and what we've already known for fulfilled prophecy. He's going to bring it to fruition and it's going to come up to pass exactly as he says. Amen? So here's my challenge. If you don't know Jesus, get with Jesus now. He's going to win this thing. Today is the day of salvation. And there is hell to pay for a person who says, I don't need this beautiful prophecy fulfilling God in my life. My promise is to you is that you do. Now let's think about something as we continue in the story. Go with me to Mark chapter 1. Once again. We could stay in Luke and read Luke 4, verses 42 to 43, but we'll just look at Mark's account once again. Chronologically, it's going on on a day-to-day -day account here at this portion in the Gospels. So it's wonderful that Jesus heals the crowds. The demons know who he is, and then verse 35 tells us, in the early morning, that very next morning, It says, in the early morning, while it was still dark, how many of you all got up when it was still dark this morning? Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. What a beautiful example. A pattern set by our Lord as to what was a regular practice for Yeshua. He gets up early when it's still dark. Everybody else has crashed out. Not a creature is stirring, not even a mouse. And Jesus is going out to a secluded place to pray. This has often been looked at down through the centuries as, again, some sort of a prescription for a spiritual discipline of solitude and silence. We're going to talk about that in a moment for the time that we have left. We have to take opportunity at these various stages in the life and ministry of Jesus to address some issues that we're struggling with in the church today. When I say we, I'm not talking about FBC. But I will talk to you about why I think the contemplative movement is completely getting this entire thing wrong about solitude and silence. But let's talk first of all, what's good solitude and silence? What, what is this about this practice of Jesus that is so refreshing to us when we see him getting up before dark to go out and to pray? When I get up before dark, it's to let two dogs out then get some coffee, 
use the restroom and maybe a shower, and then I can start, my brain's awake enough to start, oh yeah, I need to pray this morning. But really, Jesus had this as an absolute habit, and again, I believe it's from his youngest years. I believe in the prophecy in, I think it might be Jeremiah, well, I'll just say one of the prophets said that morning by morning you awaken me, and, and, and kind of the effect of pouring your word into my ears. My ears were receptive to what you taught. I believe that is how Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. I believe that is how Jesus, as the, chi as the child, also understood that God was his father personally and that he had a mission to do and that he was the Messiah. God taught him. But Jesus, we see here, and I think that there's absolutely nothing wrong with seeing him as a beautiful example of somebody who at times says, I got to get out of here for a little bit. Yes, early, before dark, he's going to he's go out and he's going to pray. He's, yes, literally starting every day right. Amen? Don't we say that's a good thing? Would you say along with me that the more we could do that, I think how much greater would our relationship with God even be? How much more maturity would we see in our life? How much more ready for a day of hardship and struggle and tribulation in perilous times would we be if we all got ourselves out of bed at an early hour, isn't it funny we call it the ungodly hour, right? But it isn't. <laughs> Think about it, man. More time spent in deliberate pursuit of the presence of God in this wonderful relationship as in, in prayer as we, we, we talk to our Father who hears us. How wonderful would it be and how much more fruit would we see in our lives? This whole study in the life of Christ is challenging me extremely poking me going you know Christ did this and you know where are you at with that and I'm still at I need coffee God please but I think there's something beautiful here you might say okay move on already no we're not going to move on we have to look at these things now I'm about to read to you some verses and portions of verses and I do not trust me you're not going to turn fast enough that's not the point I want to read to you and overwhelm you a bit with other examples of verses of Jesus withdrawing away from people. Just listen. And again, this will all be on the screen, so if you want to go back and watch it later, you can take those notes, or uh, I can send you the outline. But here, here's what's going on. I'm just going to read the verse reference and the verse. We're not going to talk about the, the exact context and everything that's going on there in those portions, but listen closely. Matthew 4.1, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit, into the wilderness. Mark 1.35, we just read that. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Luke 4.42, now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. Luke 6.12, now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Wow. Matthew 14, 13, when Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. Luke 5, 16, so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Mark 3, 7, but Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. Luke 9, 10, then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. Matthew 14, 22, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. John 6, 15, when Jesus perceived they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Mark 7, 24. From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He entered a house and wanted no one to know it. John 7, 53. And everyone went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, as was his custom. Matthew 17, 1, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Mark 9, verse 30, they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it. 
John 10, 40, he went away again beyond the Jordan. John eleven fifty four, 54, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness. John 12, 36, these things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Matthew 26, 36, this is a big one. Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. Luke twenty two forty one 41 says, and he was withdrawn from them. Now, again, all the contexts that we have that we could look at, my point was, and I hope it was made clearly, is that Jesus had a habit of going and withdrawing. And what is the purpose? To prayerfully be alone with the Father. In which would happen? Renewing and refreshing for ministry? You think Jesus had a little bit of stress in the natural as he saw the crowds pressing in on him and all of the sickness and all of these things? Listen, and stress not in a sinful way, but a burden that needed strengthening to get through every day. Would you, would we, are we pretty fair maybe in seeing that at, at all these passages? Jesus going away by himself. There's value in that, folks. Amen? Can I say that? So let's all be dismissed and go off by ourselves today. Understand that Jesus practiced biblical meditation. He's in obedience to the commands of God. And let me make the distinction right away. Eastern meditation, as we call it, of the Buddhists and the Shintos and the, uh, you know, the Hindus and these things, involves the emptying of your mind. It is a sin. It abuses the beauty and the functionality of the brains God gave us. And whether you use a mantra, which is a word that you repeat over and over until it short circuits rational thinking, and then you're in some state, or whether you're saying the word om to become one with the God in you and the, God's, you know, the God force in the universe, or whether you're doing yoga, again, where it's awakening the kundalini serpent spirit from your spine to make the journey up your back into the chakras in your brain so that you can have enlightenment. Listen, folks, all of that is wicked, evil, deception, and distortion. True biblical meditation, and you know this, the righteous man, the Bible says, meditates on the law of God day and night. What does he do? The word meditate means to chew the cud. It means to continually focus upon. So really, biblical meditation, Hebrew meditation, was to do what? Fill your mind with the word of God. Amen? The absolute opposite of losing your mind. You see, the Hindus have these guys named sadhus, and what they do is they go out into the wilderness and waste places, and they do really strange, austere, ascetic exercises and bizarre yoga rituals and bizarre prayers to these demon spirits. And then what happens? They lose their mind. They go insane. Some of these guys bury their head in the ground with like a straw to breathe through for like two years, or they stand on one leg for a year. It, why? Because it short circuits rational thought. It does away with any ability or capacity to be able to truly worship the true God. These are all deceptions from the demonic realm. So imagine my pain and, and hurt when I see coming into the church the teachings of Henry Nowen, Thomas Merton, and Thomas Kempis, and Richard Foster, and Dallas Willard, and Ruth Haley Barton, let's not forget the gals, Ann Voskamp, Sarah Young, a host of others, many of which I began seeing on the Grace Brethren websites at the Women of Grace website. Many of which are commonplace in the church today and being popularized by other teachers like Beth Moore, who is now pointing people to these people. Francis Chan, pointing people to these people. Folks, it is an epidemic in the church today. We have a counterfeit mysticism, well, well excuse me, mysticism, period, which is a counterfeit uh, process to allegedly achieve union with Christ, which is something we already have if we believe by faith, amen? I don't have to do rituals to try to uh, reach levels of enlightenment here, okay? 
I don't have to have this Gnostic revelation to evolve in my, in my thought processes in order to, quote, connect with God by doing ritual things. But all these teachers that I mentioned, man, are giving handbooks to the church as to how to do this. Ruth Haley Barton goes, close your eyes and put your palms upwards, and she does this on YouTube, and, you know, pray the scriptures with her. But why are you doing that? So you can receive. Receive what? She comes from the Shalem Institute. She has a ministry that's based at a convent. And, of course, she points people to all of these old Roman Catholic mystical practices. Is it problematic to you that the priests and nuns that sometimes practiced some of these things were complete nut jobs at the end of their lives and ministries? Or even shunned by the Roman Catholic Church in earlier years as being really on the fringe and really bizarre? Let me tell you, when you start meditating and you start levitating, there's stories of the Catholic nuns who were experiencing that. When you start to have the stigmata and begin to bleed from your hands and your head while you're in intense, fervent, bizarre, contemplative practice, when you're reading these ancient texts like the cloud of unknowing and you're trying to teach young people today to get into this stuff to cultivate a closeness with God, folks, this is not what Jesus was doing. Amen? Can we say that this morning? This is absolutely not the spiritual discipline or spiritual formation, as it is called today, of solitude. And by the way, when you hear somebody say, you need to practice the silence, when you hear that, and you'll hear that in churches by these speakers that I mentioned, and that's what's in the books that these people are getting given, even in the Grace Brethren, I was sorry to find out. When you start talking about the silence, which is that state of unknowing, that they say God wants you to enter so that you can truly encounter him in a mystical way that's beyond words, I'm telling you, run really far. Withdraw yourself to the wilderness by yourself and pray when you hear that junk being taught in your churches. We're warning against this this morning, and I have to be specific with the names that I mention because these meditative states and these disciplines of solitude and these silence are not what Jesus was doing, even though we read many verses where he withdrew by himself alone to pray. We need to beware of lauding or praising a group called the Desert Fathers who took this withdrawal and some of these very scriptures to the extreme and they went out and became hermits and monks in the desert. And all, you know, a lot of them fought the devil and, and all this other crazy stuff out in the night alone, isolated from the body of Christ, and they kind of went nuts. And some of them had some very bizarre, counterfeited, demonic experiences. It's biblical meditation, not monasticism. I want to mention briefly, the contemplatives misuse these three verses probably the most. They misuse a ton of scripture because that's how you get these teachings. Hebrews 2.20 says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. They say that's biblical evidence for why we practice the silence, that state where we're, uh, that's not what it's saying. It says be reverent and shut your mouth because of the majesty of how powerful the holy God is. That's what that verse means. It has nothing to do with some discipline of silence. Isaiah 30, 15, in repentance and rest is your salvation in quietness and trust is your strength. Oh, that must be a command to take a vow of silence in a monastery. Amen? Now, we all have people we wish would take vows of silence. That's, that's another story. But here's the thing. I wish the contemplators would shut their mouths and stop writing this junk. That's not what that means at all. It means there's a tranquility that comes with trusting God with your salvation. That's what it means. It doesn't mean to go out and practice these rituals to enter the silence. And here's the famous one that a contemplative will tell you. Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. That's their favorite verse. They all say it. Oh, we practice this Eastern-style contemplative mysticism. Why? Because we're supposed to be still and know. And that's how you're going to know that he's God. You've got to be still, which in their minds means quiet your mind. In their minds, if you want to really translate, empty your mind. And then you'll know God. Is that what that's saying? 
Read the context of Psalm 46. We don't have time this morning, but to be still and to know that he is God means you are resting in who he is, not your own strength. Not the way of the world. Not the circumstances of those that are coming against you. Be still and know that he's God means you know God and therefore you have shalom. That's what we're talking about there. We're not talking about the Bible doesn't support these contemplative practices. You're going, well, what does this have to do with Jesus? You can see we're not going to get past the fact that he withdrew by himself to pray. And I'm just clarifying today that it doesn't mean what these guys say it means. Because all of them say, well, after all, Jesus practiced the silence. No, he didn't. Jesus practiced the spiritual discipline of solitude. No, he didn't. Not in the way that it's being packaged and given to the, the, to the church. There's all kinds of other mystical things that are involved here. And I want to go to Colossians for a moment before we return to Yeshua's withdrawal for a few more moments. Colossians chapter 2. Just because we're on the subject and we're going to take every now and then, you might think, well, that was a sidetrack. What a tangent. No, we're going to take the life of Jesus as exemplary to us, and we want to make sure we clarify that when Jesus went out into the wilderness by himself, it wasn't to lose his mind and find God. Colossians 2, Paul warns against all this mysticism and all this stuff. Look at verse 20 through 23. <clears throat> he says, if you have died, Colossians, with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Like, Why are you enslaving yourselves? Essentially, to the laws of men, to the legalism that, in, that he's referencing here, okay? He says, verse 22, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and the teachings of men. He says, why do you submit yourself to those things? you got freedom in Christ. He says, these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. This, this could have been a memo to the Desert Fathers. Here, read that before you go out and become monastic and live in a cave and lose your mind. And then come back like you're some enlightened spiritual teacher. Oh, but look at me. I'm self-abasing myself. I'm taking a vow of silence. I'm, I'm submitting my, you know, Whatever, my brains. I just want to check my brain at the door when I come into worship today. I want to lose my mind in worship to God. That's the junk that he was warning them about in Colossae in their day. And these rules and these requirements and these handbooks that people are giving out about mysticism, talking about asceticism, a severe treatment of the body for the purpose of trying to gain some level of enlightenment. Listen, if you want to fast, do it because God led you to, and you're telling God, listen, this is my devotion to you. And don't let the rest of us know, amen? Like Jesus told him, don't suck your cheeks in and look, mm, boy, am I hungry. Let me tell you why. It's not what we're supposed to be doing there. Man. Go out and pray to God and take some time out of the busyness of your day. Because this is what he has ordained for us to keep our sanity in this world. Amen? Take some time for you and God by yourself. There is nothing wacky or weird about that. But don't buy into all the systems that promise. If you do that, then you're going to find a deeper level of mystical walk with God. Here's the point, man. You're in a relationship, and the more time you spend with God, the better and the closer you get to him. Amen? It's that simple. But all these rules of self-made religion, all the contemplative practices and the mysticism that you'll go nuts trying to nail down anyway, don't let it take you away from the simple truth that Jesus spent time in the presence of the Father by himself. Let's go back to Mark chapter 1, and we'll close it this morning with these words. <laughs> Everybody ready for hearing Pastor Mike and communion?
going to be a good day. Verse 35, in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went away to a secluded place and was praying there. My final statement on that verse is, I encourage you to do the same thing if you can do it. Amen? Oh, but I can't get up early. Well, just find a place later. It's fine. God's not mad at you. This is descriptive of what Jesus did. It is not a rule or a law that you must follow in some monastic order. Amen? Just do it and you'll be happy you did all the time. I promise you this. Any time spent in prayer is good for you. And you will feel and reap the benefits of that time with God. And sometimes, and I'll tell you right now, I love praying with you people. I don't know if you know this, but I'm looking forward to it more and more every Sunday, knowing that, you know what, if we have to drop everything and say thank you, God, or pray together, we're all at the drop of a hat. We're like, let's do this. I feel the unity of the body praying to the head of the church, praying to to God, and and I, I love it. But I also value, I value individual alone time with God as well. And we need to do that. Simon and his companions searched for him, verse 36. Just because you've stepped out a little bit doesn't mean the world stops running, right? Where's Jesus? Oh, no. Where'd he go? They found him and they said to him, everyone's looking for you. Jesus said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. Jesus took time. And the Father continued to prepare him so that when they came to him and says, hey, life goes on, people are looking for you, what's up? Need, 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 need. Let's go. And let's go to the other towns as well because I'm strengthened and ready to do what God sent me to do. Amen? Father, thank you for Jesus and his example this morning. Lord, we thank you that we're going to see time and again as as as. Our time continues here on Sunday mornings to look at the life of Jesus. Father, I know that we are going to learn many awesome truths. And this morning was a nugget. This morning was simplicity in the sense of, I believe, it's just a no-brainer to look and see the beauty and the purity of what Jesus did. And the exhortation we then have to be as Christ-like as we can in the strength you provide. Father, I do mean that. I do believe that means that no matter what time of the day, because that's not a prescription for us, but we ought to be alone with you and enjoying our relationship with you in a biblical, honoring, worshipful way. Help us in our prayer. Help us to be like Jesus in our devotion to prayer. And Father, I believe you will make a way for us to Come away for a while and talk to you as needed. And we'll leave those sessions together strengthened and ready to use our mind and our hearts and our bodies in service to you. Father, I guess I'm asking, help us to be those living sacrifices whose service is acceptable to you and holy and right. And Father, I pray for the body of Christ that we would just really grasp and enjoy the truth of your word as the Holy Spirit helps us interpret, understand it, and apply it to our lives. Father, we pray for those who have yet to know you because they have yet to repent and believe in the one that you've sent. Convict hearts today, Lord, and give us divine appointments to point people to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.